Okay, you're all set. Good morning. You're here with the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. And as you can see from our attire, this is casual Friday on a Thursday. So everybody's dressed down after yesterday's um, prolonged hearing. So we're here to uh, hear a couple of reports. Um, this is not a public hearing, not a work session. It's just time for us to meet our statutory duty of getting reports back from certain agencies. Um, and I am State Senator Mark Lawrence. I am the Senate Chair of the Committee. I represent Southern York County, the towns of Kittery, York, Agunquit, Elliott's, and South Berwick, and half of Berwick. With me today is my co-chair uh, from the House, Representative Barry, and I'll just ask him to introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you this Thursday morning, and I am Seth Barry. I do represent House District 55, which is Bowdoin, Bowdenham, most of Richmond, and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec. And next, I'll go to uh, Representative Wadsworth, the House Republican lead. Hey, good morning, everybody. Nate Wadsworth, I represent the towns of Hiram, Porter, Brownfield, Freiburg, and Lovell. And next to uh, Paige Ziegler. Yes, I'm Representative Paige Sigler from District 96, the seven towns in Waldo County of Belmont, Liberty, Lincolnville, Montville, Morrow, Palermo, and Searsmont. Next to Representative Steve Foster. Good morning, I'm Steve Foster. I represent District 104, which includes the towns of Dexter, Exeter, Charleston, Stetson, and Garland. And then to uh, Representative uh, Kessler. Good morning, I'm Chris Kessler representing part of South Portland and a little smidgen of Cape Elizabeth. Next to Senator Eloise Vitelli. Good morning, everyone. I'm Eloise Vitelli representing Senate District 23, which is all of Sagadaha County and the town of Dresden in Lincoln County. Next to Representative Trey Stewart, uh, excuse me, Senator Trey Stewart. Morning, folks. I'm Trey Stewart, State Senator in District 2, which is 51 communities in Aroostook and Penobscot counties, and I reside in Presque Isle. And with us today is our clerk, uh, Jason Aldering. Did I pronounce that right, Jason? Uh, it's pronounced Allarding, actually. Allarding. Yes. Okay. So Jason Allarding, and Jason is the person when you're scheduling to testify before our committee in a public hearing, you wanna become his best friend. And then we'll go on to our analyst, Lindsay Laxon. Good morning, my name is Lindsay Laxon. I'm a legislative anal analyst with the Office of Policy and Legal Analysis. Great, and Lindsay, why don't you tell us what, what reports we're gonna be receiving today? Certainly, um, so starting out this morning at nine, uh, we will be hearing from the Public Utilities Commission on their Report on protocols and procedures necessary to ensure delivery of crisis response services. Um, this report has been posted to the EUT committee website um, for individuals looking to follow along. And then at 10 o'clock this morning, we will be conducting uh, quasi-independent state entity reviews. Um, so the committee will be hearing from Maine Municipal and Rural Electrification Cooperative Agency and Efficiency Maine Trust. Great, thank you. Any questions from the committee before we begin? Okay, well, why don't we start right off with the PUC and uh, if you could beam them over, Jason. That should be everybody. Okay, and who do we have? Uh, My co-chair has frozen. Oh, there he is. Senator Lawrence, we, okay. you cut out for a moment. Okay, so I don't know who from the PUC wants to be the first. I'll just ask you to raise your hand and I will uh, have you go first. I see Director Maria Jakes perhaps uh, 
Maria would like to indicate to us who will be presenting. Yeah, I don't see her. I don't see her live on. Right. Uh, hold on. I'm not able. I'm trying to. There we go. Oh, there we go. There. Uh, good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and honorable members. Of just tell us what order they're coming in. Uh, good morning, Senator Lawrence, Representative Barry, and honorable members of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. My name is Maria Jakes, and I'm director of the Emergency Services Education Bureau. That's the state agency within the Public Utilities Commission that is responsible for the state 911 system. Resolves 2021, Chapter 29, required the Bureau, in consultation with the Department of Public Safety, the E91 Council, crisis response service providers, and other stakeholders, to research and review protocols and procedures necessary to ensure the delivery of crisis response services uh, under the state's 911 system, and provide a report back to you by February 1st. Over the summer, we went out to bid seeking expert 911 consulting services with related crisis protocol experience to help us with this project. Ultimately, we contracted with mission critical partners. And today I have with me uh, Bonnie Maney and Jason Malloy from Mission Critical to help uh, to deliver the report. And with your permission, I'm gonna turn it over to them now, but we'll, but we'll remain available to answer questions. Yeah, go ahead, Maria. Okay, so uh, I guess we have to bring in Bonnie and Jay. So she should be beamed over. So all she has to do is unmute herself. Okay. You all set, Bonnie, if you can unmute. I am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good morning, Senator Lawrence, uh, Representative Barry, honorable members of the uh, Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. As Maria stated, my name is Bonnie Maining. I'm the Operations Manager for Mission Critical Partners, Facilities and Operations Practice Team, as well as the Project Manager for this particular project. I have been in public safety communications profession for 32 years, and with me today is my colleague, Jason Malloy. He's a communication consultant with our team. Jason also has over 31 years in public safety, including fire and emergency medical service, as well as uh, public safety communications and emergency response protocols. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, Please do. Okay. Second share. There we go. Great. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so before we begin, I uh, would really like to express our appreciation to each of you um, for the cooperation and the opportunity uh, for Mission Critical Partners to be part of this very important project. Also appreciation to Maria and her team, along with all of those who participated in the focus groups and interviews who shared uh, their thoughts with us. Today, we will be presenting three components of the report to you. We're gonna begin with some background information followed by an outline of the approach that we use to engage stakeholders. And then we'll provide you with an overview of the recommendations. You are welcome to ask questions as we go along or wait to the end, which, whichever works. It's probably best, Bonnie, if we wait till the end. Perfect, wonderful. So to begin with the background information and to share how we came to presenting to you today, in 2020, the uh, FCC, Federal Communications Commission, adopted rules to establish 988 as our National Suicide Prevention and Veteran Crisis Line. This would blend those two together to provide quicker access to services. That has resulted in states, counties, and municipalities across the country opening up conversations to find answers on how they're going to manage this for their particular areas. As Maria stated in her introduction with the resolve issued in June of last year to facilitate the inclusion of crisis response in the existing E911 system, the issuance of the RFP in July and award to mission critical partners in October, we set about providing uh, to provide consulting and research services 
culminating in a report to be presented to this legislative committee. The focus of the report is on the protocols and procedures necessary to integrate 911 and 988 so that 911 professionals and field responders will have what they need to be better able to serve Maine residents in crisis. As for the stakeholder engagement process, this is where we really dove in and had to explore what stakeholders' concerns were, how the system currently worked or did not work together, what the risks and what the opportunities would be, integration of mental health and social issues services with 911 is such a new field of expertise. We completed a combination of in-state and out-of-state research to be able to develop a very holistic picture and provide practical recommendations. As part of the in-state research, we conducted interviews with diverse groups of subject matter experts within the state. We facilitated seven focus group discussions, conducted eight virtual tours of what we call public safety answering points, which are your 911 centers, and four of those same type of visits with the dispatch only centers in the state. These focus groups and tours were followed by a custom survey that was sent to about 168 email addresses and included representatives from across this public safety communications industry, including the public safety answering points and dispatch only centers, law enforcement, fire and EMS uh, medical services agencies. Then for the out of state research, since 2020 when mission critical partners recognized that these changes were trending with regards to providing mental health services, we've been compiling a library of information, which we put up against a set of, site of criteria to select a number of agencies that we thought were very similar in demographics to the state of Maine and your constituents and residents. A set of 12 of these were interviewed with everything from pilot projects to established programs from the private and public sectors. We also reviewed articles, public policies, and a variety of procedures to come up with a set of recommendations that we think will serve the residents and emergency services professionals well into the future. One thing we do wanna point out from the stakeholder process is that it was abundantly clear that stakeholders from both 911 and the field like police, fire, and EMS, as well as current crisis services in the state do have a very high level of concern and they want things to be well thought out. They are passionate about the service to the public. And while they were concerned, they did recognize at the same time that there were changes needed. They just want those changes to be well thought out and done safely. Across the in-state conversations, there were definitely concerns about liability, staffing, funding, and especially screening criteria. Screening criteria is important to be able to confidently know if a caller could be better served by 988. Additional topics of discussion with the in-state sessions also included determining crisis caller location if a call came into 988 and was transferred to 911, and then also communication and information sharing. At the same time, when we talked to the out-of-state stakeholders, they also addressed these same topic areas, noting that crisis services have capabilities, skills, and the professional education to help callers providing a higher, not lower standard of care than, that, um, than that, the training that has been provided to 911 at this point. They also impressed the importance and strong need for relationship building and early engagement by diverse resources, and stakeholders and response groups as well. That now summar summarizes how we got here and the stakeholder engagement process. So I'm gonna move on to the recommendations. So to set, you know, to introduce you to those recommendations, you will see several in the report. However, we've distilled them down to the three that we're gonna cover here. In the full report, there is much more detail for you. The first recommendation you see here is to implement a companion protocol that integrates into the emergency medical dispatch or EMD protocol system that is actually currently used in Maine today. If you're not familiar with what a protocol is, a protocol is a scripted guideline um, that's used by public safety answering points and many of the dispatch only centers in Maine. 
protocols provide a consistent level of service for those in need. In addition to EMD, emergency medical dispatch, the state also uses emergency fire dispatch. These are nationally recognized commercially available protocols that are used by agencies nationwide. There are several different vendors, but when it comes to the emergency mental health dispatch, another acronym for you, or EMHD, there is really not anything because this field, as we mentioned, is in its infancy. And right now, this is really the only commercially available one today. Fortunately, it is um, from the vendor, Priority Dispatch Corporation, that already provides you with your EMD and EFD protocols. So emergency medical dispatch and emergency fire dispatch protocols. Of course, procurement will be subject to purchasing requirements. However, there are benefits with this being part of the existing priority dispatch protocol system. And with there being nothing else on the market at this moment in time, this is the most cost effective way this recommendation includes integrating the EMHD requirement into the existing emergency medical dispatch statute 32 MRS 85, along with the modification to 25 MRS 2927. The latter modification will allow the funding for EMHD. The funding comes from the 911 surcharge fund and with, mod with the modification enables alignment of the cost for emergency mental health dispatch certification and protocol implementation using the current funding rules. In addition to being cost effective, this approach also will shorten the transition and time to proficiency for the call takers and dispatchers. For telecommunicators, like I said, call takers and dispatchers, it does take time to learn a new protocol. Having a protocol is also expected to reduce the risk exposure for all agencies involved in the crisis response, being both 911 and crisis response services. And just to mention again, that crisis response services that exist today in the state of Maine, that's what will eventually become 988. This is because protocols provide a standard set of screening criteria to support the safe transfer of calls to alternative higher levels of care. You may be thinking that an EMHD protocol would be more complex than the medical and fire protocols because you can have a wider variety of mental health issues than medical issues. From the perspective of complexity though, the overall product is written to match formatting of the current emergency medical dispatch protocols. So from a complexity standpoint, it is going to be much of what the telecommunicators are already used to seeing. At a basic level, the content is largely based around what the mental health community calls suicidology and the determination of factors of risk. As an example, the use of the EMHD protocols by a telecommunicator function much in the same manner as questioning a caller before transferring them to poison control. The EMHD protocol asks questions that identify safety risks and risks of suicide. If the protocol determines that a safety issue and or risk of suicide or self-harm does not exist, the telecommunicator could transfer the call to a crisis line or 988 for further assistance. Similar to poison control who has their own set of protocols for address, addressing ingestions and poisonings, crisis line also have their own set of protocols for addressing behavioral health events. Sometimes a dual response may still be required, which the protocol will allow for. That's all on the administrative rules and policy and procedures that a committee of stakeholder, uh, stakeholders could provide guidance on. But we're really not trying to oversimplify the scenario either. But from a risk perspective, integrating a commercially available protocol that the telecommunicators are familiar with to provide screening criteria and facilitate bridging services together is a good first step. So the second recommendation though is to conduct a rolling implementation of the emergency mental health dispatch protocol so that all of the existing telecommunicators can be trained. This will take some time because there are approximately 450 telecommunicators in the state. This approach also incorporates requiring standardized statewide training of all new 
public safety answering point and dispatch only center staff as they're hired. This is to make sure that they are also trained in this protocol and any other crisis response related skills that might be required as well. When it comes to this recommendation, it is important to understand that this change is pretty significant and it is going to require careful planning and coordination. Because it involves the safety of the individuals in need and based on lessons learned from the past EMD and EFD protocol implementations, the recommendation is for a phased approach, starting with facilitating the development of a rolling implementation schedule. This would cover the procurement, training, and the implementation itself. It is anticipated that this could be about a three-year cycle with one year for the developing of the rulemaking, administrative rules and policies, and then two years for the implementation. We understand that this seems like a really long time, especially when there's a lot of pressure to get something in place sooner than later. However, this is really formulated again from the lessons learned and input from both the vendor as well as um, experience in the state of Maine with implementing the EMD and EFD protocols like I mentioned. This will also allow for the application of a good change management approach to facilitate this paradigm shift. It also helps outline really deliberately and mindfully the changes to each part of the behavioral health ecosystem that really address some of those concerns that we heard from the in-state stakeholders and the advice from the out-of-state stakeholders. Additionally, It'll provide time for agencies that may incur costs not funded by the E911 surcharge fund and to budget for implementation and training. Without going into too much detail, a couple of things that can impact the implementation and training. First is that the training is three days, which in addition to training the existing telecommunicators will add three days to the current 15 day curriculum for the new higher training that happens up at the academy. Because it's integrated into the EMD dispatch protocol set, those dispatch only centers that have elected to become emergency medical dispatch centers um, would be required if they want to continue to do that. Um, so they would also have to take on the EMHD protocol. This is because if they didn't, it would create a gap in the services across the state. There is a concern about um, with the length of the rollout of this protocol, it's is really in response to what we heard from the stakeholders. In other words, they said, let's carefully think this through and not rush. And so we make sure that we do a quality job. By following these funding rules that we have um, followed all along, um, and this is something that the legislature could address um, if we don't pay for the training costs of dispatch only centers. Okay, moving along to the third recommendation. This recommendation is in two parts. First is to establish a multidisciplinary committee. This can help with concerns about the length of time for implementation as well. This committee can begin working through and making suggestions regarding administrative rules and policies. This is hearing and responding to the information and advice again received from the out-of-state interviews of how their programs have been best served with this multidisciplinary committee comprised of a cross section of the stakeholders. This would be very collaborative and make sure that things are looked at very closely with a lot of compassion and concern for those that are in need and how they can best be served. This also then ties into the second part of this recommendation, which is having an emergency mental health dispatch protocol coordinator. Again, this is a very big lift. It's a paradigm shift. There is going to be um, a need for change management and the EMHD protocol coordinator really is there to help facilitate the implementation. This individual can also help coordinate the multidisciplinary committee and be a liaison, if you will, and help promote a smooth transition. The development of metrics are going to be important to understanding and driving the improvements, as well as determining if the decisions that are being made are actually having the outcomes that are anticipated and desired, and is another area that the coordinator could facilitate developing along with reporting. 
Implementing this recommendation will help ensure proper communication and implementation across Maine's public safety and behavioral health ecosystems as the field of EM uh, HD matures. So of course there are initial and recurring costs associated with these recommendations. All those subject to negotiation with the vendor, a per seat licensing fee of $500 and a $222 per person training fee have been quoted by the current protocol provider. The total initial protocol implementation and training costs is projected to be approximately $163,900. In addition, adding the EMHD protocol coordinator to the EMS staff would add an annual salary of approximately $100,000 funded through the E911 surcharge. This brings the total for the initial first year costs to approximately $263,900. Beyond the first year, the $500 per seat licensing fee would increase the annual protocol provider expense by approximately $64,000. And assuming that the ESCB conducts six training courses of 15 telecommunicators each per year, the annual training costs would increase by approximately $19,980. This is not including any ancillary expenses. The total annual recurring costs are estimated at about $183,980, which includes the funding for the EMHD protocol coordinator. So funding for these recommendations leverages the previously established funding model, which includes funding for software and training costs paid by the E911 surcharge funds for the public safety answering points. This funding model does not pay local costs, including backfill, and it does not pay for software and training costs for the dispatch only centers. So under the current funding regulations, dispatch only centers would bear their implementation and training costs. And this leads us up to our final slide. We understand that these recommendations add another mandated protocol. We also know that the anticipated initial and re reoccurring costs may be perceived as an unfunded mandate. However, if this is not pursued by the public safety answering points and required by the dispatch only centers that already voluntarily provide EMD, a gap may be created and it could be persistent. So it really is important to closely follow the methodology that the state already has in place to make sure that there is consistent service. Whether you are in a rural community or in Portland, you should have confidence that these services are available consistently throughout the state. Even with these concerns, there are several cost effective and proficiency aspects about integrating with the existing protocol systems. One is the quality assurance requirements do not change because it becomes an in integrated e into the EMD protocol itself. So then the number of calls that are required to be reviewed by EMS does not change. There is also no additional training required for quality assurance beyond the initial EMHD training. Another positive is that there is no additional CAD software or computer aided dispatch software or interfaces that need to be purchased. And there are also no additional recertification requirements or costs. Although crisis services do exist in Maine, 988 right now does not. It is scheduled to go live nationwide in July of this year. So there really is a short amount of time to make decisions on how it's going to integrate with 911 in the state of Maine. The landscape of this integration is changing so rapidly that when we started this project, the protocol was not available, but now it is. Today, telecommunicators in Maine do not possess the training, skills, and abilities to confidently and accurately screen calls and determine which may be better served by crisis line responses rather than traditional police, fire, or EMS resources. But with the protocol, they can in the future. It is essential that these gaps are addressed. So those calling for assistance to 911, directly to a dispatch only center, or a crisis line in the state are afforded a level of care that aligns with their needs. 
Implementing these re recommendations will fill that gap and put Maine on a path to providing services for alternate, um, alternate support and referral of information, um, sorry, referral of individuals uh, in crisis and an opportunity to be a model for other states to follow. The state is addressing this in a manner that other states are not. So it is very commendable that all are, um, are taking this approach and looking at it from a perspective of providing consistent support throughout the state. This then is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to have mission critical partners assist the state with this important project. Jason and I are happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Are there questions from the committee? Does someone on the Zoom have some background noise going? I can hear something almost like running water. I hear the same. I think that might okay. be my Any background. Any questions let from me, the committee? Let me fix that. That's let me, better. Let me mute myself. Okay, great. So any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much to the PUC. I, I, sorry, I, Oops, I do have- I'm sorry, Representative Barry has a question. That's okay. Um, I was wondering first, could uh, would it be possible to take down the screen share? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that excellent uh, presentation. It's very helpful to, um, learn how this uh, how this has evolved and um, your recommendations for how we proceed. Um, I wonder if um, you could say uh, just a, a little bit more about the um, the the stakeholder groups um, that you worked with. Uh, you know, you you kind of you, you you did a number of interviews. Um, sent out the, especially in Maine, you sent out the, um, the email to, I think you said 168 email addresses. And um, I'm, I'm sure you said it and I just missed it, but could you um, speak about the response that you got from those emails, the response rate and, uh, and the, the a little more specifics about the, the concerns you heard from those populations? So there was actually two parts. I'll let Bonnie kind of fill in here, but we did the stakeholders groups. Um, there, maybe she can count how many stakeholders there were, but we had several of those. Uh, and there was, uh, you know, 15 to 20 people uh, at each of those sessions, uh, which we thought was very good, representing a, uh, a wide variety of disciplines and, uh, you know, dispatch centers from, yeah. So we had those specific just for the PSAPs. We had them um, uh, for dispatch only centers, for training center folks. We had them for police. Uh, we had one for fire and EMS. And we also had one with the crisis response uh, population, as well as the E911 Council. And I will say, during the E911 Council and the crisis response uh, uh, stakeholder. Um, sessions, we also had interpreters available so that we could represent the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, they could have uh, input as well. And then following that is when Bonnie and her team sent out 168 uh, questionnaires specifically to public safety. We didn't have an overwhelming response to that. Uh, Bonnie maybe can tell you exactly what that was. But we did hear from some agencies that hadn't afforded them, uh, taken advantage of the in-person stakeholder uh, sessions. So Great. thank you, Maria. Yes, of that 168 and understanding that there was some crossover, that if we sent them to the PSAPs, they could also be the same law enforcement agency and such. Um, but it really was only 18 agencies completed the survey, so agencies. So there could have been multiple emails sent there. Um, 
the responding agencies, 10 of them served rural jurisdictions, two were a mix of rural and suburban jurisdictions, three were a mix of rural, um, suburban and metropolitan jurisdictions, and one was just a, one was a suburban jurisdiction. Um, one was a city and the other one was a statewide agency. Um, the, the feedback ranged from anything from, yes, we're all in, uh, you know, as long as we have the criteria and the tools we need to um, at least one of them was, um, we're not, we're not doing this for anything, you know, so um, I think a lot of that, though, kind of tying into what we found in the interview sessions and the focus groups was really, though, a lot of it is based on um, unknown. And as I mentioned in the presentation, the paradigm shift and not having the tools to be as confident as they are today um, in delivering EMD and EFD protocols. And so just making sure that they have those tools and, and the training to confidently be able to add this new set of resources to their tools. Wonderful, thank you. And if I may, Mr. Chair, Mr. Co-Chair, a follow-up question. I'll go ahead and give myself permission. Um, Director Jakes, uh, or, or any of you for Mission Critical, um, Thank you for the report. I, I, I should have said at the outset, I, I think this, you know, the, the, the detailed report um, that was sent to us by email and, and this overview today is, is very helpful. And um, I'll just speak for myself. I'm very interested in moving forward with it. I think this could clearly save lives um, and help people in need. Um, could you remind us in, in the report, and I've only been able to skim it, but have you made um, specific uh, language recommendations to the committee regarding what what we would need to change in statute to enable this, and, and I'll, maybe Director Jakes, you want to take that first. Um, we cert I'd, I'd certainly like to see what we can do to move this along. So we referenced the sections of statute that would need modification, but we did not uh, develop specific language. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Anything else, Representative Barry? I think that's it at this time. We can take up, I, I would like to take up with our, our analyst uh, the opportunity to make some changes and report out a bill uh, pursuant to this report. Okay, are there any other questions from members of the committee? I have my hand up. Yes, Representative <laughs> Grohowski. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you for the report. I think this is um, really a uh, critical effort to be undertaking. And I also agree with Representative Barry that I think it can save lives and also give our citizens confidence that they will get the help they need when they call. Um, <clears throat> I know I've had concerns from my own constituents worried about calling on behalf of other people in crisis that things could end up in a, in a scarier situation than, you know, so I think it, we don't want to have people give pause when they need to dial 911 about what could happen. That being said, um, I wonder, I, I think it's probably challenging to identify some of the, the groups of people who are on the, the front end who are affected. You know, it seems like you've talked a lot to the people who answer the calls and who provide the services, but, um, do you think that in that uh, ongoing staff position, it would be possible over time to, to get that information from our, our crisis support groups and maybe even affected individuals to see what their experience was like? Or is that something that, I mean, it seems like it's a new field, so I don't know if that maybe you found that's happening in other states or if you um, got any input from people who have experienced uh, making those calls or receiving <clears throat> um, help that, you know, went into this report or could you see that happening down the line as we engage in this? Um, so the people that we engaged, um, we actually invited every member of the 988 stakeholder group to be part of our focus group. And from that, we had a lot of care, um, you know, frontline care providers uh, provide input, but we did not have, you know, 
use us of crisis response services as part of that. I mean, we wouldn't have access to that kind of information. They would have had to voluntarily, you know, um, identify themselves. Um, and, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, as you can understand, um, would have been difficult. But, you know, probably you could have, I, I mean, I don't, you could have like a 911 council, for example, has uh, public at large members, and perhaps in the stakeholder group, that would be, you know, the, um, that Bonnie referenced the ongoing committee uh, or whatever uh, we call it. There could be some public at large seats so that possibly we could get, you know, some kind of representation from in that capacity. Any I, other question, Representative Grosky? I was just going to mention, if I could, um, from yes, the we, we may not, so to Maria's point with the, the in state, but from the out of state, um, we did talk to Aurora, Colorado, Austin, Texas, Baltimore, Maryland, Portland, Oregon, Charleston, South Carolina, um, DC's OUC, which is our Office of Unified Communications, Fairbanks, Alaska. Houston, Texas, Missoula, Montana, um, and actually, no, not Newport, um, and then Richmond, Virginia as well. So we were talking to those folks who have a variety of, again, experience, whether they're a brand new implementation or as in the case of Oregon, as you know, they have the CAHOOTS program there. Uh, we also spoke to the um, uh, state of Minnesota and the Vera Institute as well. So we, we did look across the board at a variety of, of folks there that may be also having that, you know, that actual live experience already. And not directly answering your question, but just to give you some additional information uh, on the protocols that have been developed, those protocols uh, were developed with, uh, with that community in mind. They were developed based on research uh, that has been conducted by social work and uh, mental health experts that also have a uh, direct 911 experience. Uh, and using that research, they were able to develop that uh, additional protocol. So it is directly based off of uh, some of the information and experiences that that community has had throughout the past. Representative Grohowski, any follow up? Um, no, thank you. That was very helpful to dig in a little more. Appreciate it. Okay, and back to Representative Barry for an additional question. Yes, thank you. Um, firstly, uh, I just wanted to double check my understanding that the um, EMHD uh, protocol that you're recommending here is, uh, there's only one vendor at this time. Is that right? That is correct. Got it. And um, I just would would love to know if, if is that a, is that a for profit or a not for profit uh, vendor? Can you give us a little more detail about that organization? So the organization that has developed the protocol itself uh, is a for profit. Uh, it is the existing vendor that the state already has contracted with to provide the emergency medical dispatch and the emergency fire dispatch protocols. So it is, it is the existing vendor that the, that the state is familiar with and has worked with in the past. Jason, uh, what about the training piece? The training piece is provided by uh, the 911 Training Institute. Uh, those are the folks that are the social work and mental health experts that also have the 911 uh, background as well. Uh, I do not have a clear answer. I can certainly research that briefly. Uh, if that's of consequence, I can certainly find out. Uh, I'm sure that maybe a brief uh, internet search may reveal that information, but I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Got it. Um, and then as a follow-up, uh, there's Go no ahead, from my co-chair. 
Um, <clears throat> do you, uh, does Mission Critical have any financial ties to the vendor? No, we do not. Um, Mission Critical Partners, which is actually in our contract with the state of Maine and in our scope of work, we have a very, very strict um, vendor neutrality policy um, and commitment. So uh, we do not have any ties to a vendor. Great, thank vendor. you. And one more quick follow-up. Uh, yes, go you, ahead, Representative Barry. Thank you. Do you anticipate any... Um, any competition evolving in this field? I mean, it, you know, we're, I'm, I'm just a little uncomfortable with it, you know, um, being a, a, you know, a, a sole source, essentially, um, right. contract. Com completely understood. Jason, I'm going to toss that back over to you and what, do, anything that we know that Power Phone or APCO could be doing at this point? To my knowledge, at this point, uh, they have not and when I say they, I'm referring to there are three major players, if you will, in the 911 protocol industry. Priority Dispatch, who is the state's current provider, uh, as well as the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, or APCO, and also a company called PowerPhone. To my knowledge, they are not at the present time developing uh, those software protocols. Or I'm sorry, the, the dispatch protocols. However, um, if that's something that they are doing uh, in the background that's not been publicly made available, then it is certainly possible that in the next six months or year or two years uh, that a product from those agencies could also uh, be commercially available. Uh, but as was stated in the presentation, uh, this is the only known uh protocol solution at the present time, and it does integrate directly with the existing uh, emergency medical dispatch protocol and the accompanying EMD software that goes with that protocol. Any follow-up, Representative Barry? Yes, so could you, I know you said this in the presentation and the report, but just could you, could you reiterate the ongoing cost of, of holding a license? A lot of this is the initial training, and you know, obviously that that needs to happen, but the, the, the ongoing costs would be, would be what? Uh, are you talking about all recurring costs? Uh, specifically for the vendor. It would be about uh, $20,000, $19,980. Depends on how many seats we have, which moves a little. <laughs> per year. Yes. Got it. Okay. Representative and Barry, any follow-up? One last question. Um, oh, actually, I apologize. I made yep. an error. Can I correct that? It's sixty-four thousand dollars for the licenses. The twenty thousand was about what it would cost for us to train new hires. I apologize. Got it. Uh, I guess one last question, Ms. Jakes. Do you, would you anticipate if we were to go forward and and um, you know make the necessary legislative changes to um, to have this happen, that the commission would be um, looking for um, an opportunity for for competitive uh, bids um, in in the future periodically? So, yes, sorry, is uh, that directed at the commission or the vendor? Yes. The commission. Okay. For, for, Ms., for Director Jakes. Yeah, uh, yeah um, that is a requirement of purchases uh, to periodically go out to bid. Okay, and additional questions, Representative Grahowski? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, for that. Uh, I am curious, Director Jakes, um, what, if you can remind us, did we have a surplus in the E911 fund and does that still exist? Um, or, and I guess the second question is, in order to pay for something like this, do you expect that we would need to adjust the E911 surcharge at all? So I don't know what, exactly what the surplus is today, but I will tell you that um, we did reduce the surcharge by 10 cents a couple of years back with the idea of, of spending it down. And, and currently we are working towards that goal. Um, so we are not, the current surcharge does not uh, fully fund the cost of 
the 91 system today. So we are using up some of that reserve. So it, in time, it, what, what this would do essentially is speed up the point at which we would have to look back at the surcharge funding and see what it costs, um, you know, what would need to be done with it. I, I don't, I mean, I hope that answers your question. So, Sarah Gronsky, any follow up? Um, yeah, that's helpful to know that it, it sounds like there's probably enough in there to cover the initial cost, maybe a couple of years. But if, if you could um, get back to us with those numbers and just a sense of how fast we'd be spending down if we added this on top, that would be. Yeah. And maybe also, like, if we add one cent to the surcharge, what does that gain us? I'm just. I don't have a great sense of like how much tinkering adds up to how much money. Yeah, historically, and this I probably shouldn't do this, but off the top of my head, five cents is about nine hundred to a million dollars a year. That's what it generates. But I can get those figures for you, uh, and, mm -hmm. and what the trend down is. And just so you know, the other factor that's coming to play is we are. Um, anticipating um, going out to bid uh, for the NG901 system as well. In the, um, and so that it, it, we actually, um, so that's also something we have to keep in mind when looking at those reserve funds. Any follow up, Representative Grohowski? Representative Grohowski? No, sorry. I won't shake my head next time. <laughs> Representative uh, Barry has his hand up, however. I do see that. So back to Representative Barry uh, for additional questions. Thank you uh, for Director Jakes. Would you be um, available to work with our analysts if the committee uh, saw fit to request it uh, to create some legislation to enable these recommendations to go forward in law? Yes, I would. And I'd probably enlist the support of Deirdre to assist us as well. Great, thank you. Any follow-up, Representative Barry? All set. Any other questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, we appreciate it. Thank you for your time. You're most welcome. And, and I will just go on to um, the um, reports we have to come before our committee. Um, Lindsay, uh, can you identify who in the um, attendees is ready to uh, testify? Certainly, bear with me one moment. Actually, uh, Representative Barry, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I guess just a question for you, Lindsay. Do you, do you need a, additional direction uh, from the committee regarding um, the report that we just heard? What I'm understanding is that the committee, I mean, the committee has authority to report out a bill based on this report. So it sounds like you would like me to work with, um, with the PUC based on the recommendations contained in the report with respect to changes to um, Maine law. Is that correct? That's my personal view. I, I'm not sure about the rest of the committee. Anything further, Representative Barry? E yes, uh, Senator Lawrence. <clears throat> um, I guess I'd like to see if we could just take a straw poll of the committee to determine whether um, our analysts should spend time on that. Because I'd hate to send her off on a wild goose chase if there isn't uh, an agreement on the part of the rest of the committee. Well, exactly what are you asking our analysts to do? To draft uh, language uh, pursuant to the resolve that led to the report that we just heard that would enable the recommendations in the report to go forward. Okay, well, that would have to be done as on a work session as an action of the committee. So uh, we can save that for when we are in work session. I don't believe, Senator Lawrence, that there is a work session scheduled for this bill or, or any bill well, to be we, scheduled as to be advertised as a work session. 
right? Well, we have a schedule meeting immediately after this. So maybe we can talk about that with Lindsay and putting it on for a work session. Um, okay, I, um, if, if Lindsay, if that works for you, um, I'm happy to try to do it that way. Certainly. Great. Representative Grohowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just have a question because I don't, I guess I don't really recall back to when we drafted legislation that we were authorized to draft as part of a report, probably because the session was cut short in my first, uh, second session. <laughs> Um, so would we have a work session where we say, yes, we want to see language and another work session on the language or how does that, how did that, would that process unfold? It would be the former. We would need to have a work session to discuss reporting out legislation. And then we would need to have that legislation drafted. Um, I can check with the presiding officers, whether that legislation needs a public hearing or not. Um, but that would be a question of mine, whether it does need a public hearing. And my guess is they will probably say, hold a public hearing in the interest of transparency in the legislative process. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my position would certainly be, uh, as there is no bill yet uh, reported out that we would certainly if the bill were approved to go through in this session, have a public hearing for that bill. I know that uh, I have uh, folks in my area, constituents who I'm quite certain are going to have the same position on these protocols that they have on protocols in the past and would want to be heard from. So thank you. Yeah, and I, I would agree, Representative Foster, and that's why I'm trying to have a deliberative process this where we can have public transparency on what's being done. Representative Barry. Thank you. Um, in, in the interest of, you know, because the report is fresh and because I suspect that stakeholders who are interested in this topic are watching now, um, I think it would be wise for the committee to, to just vote on whether to ask our analysts to draft something that we could then schedule for a public hearing and, and do that while it's fresh in our minds. So I'm going to make a motion that we go into work session specifically just for the question of whether to ask our analysts to draft legislation um, and hope that we can make that decision quickly so that we can then schedule a public hearing or not, depending on the will of the committee. So that's my motion. The move to go into, into work session. Is there a second? Senator Vitelli? Yep, you need to unmute. Sorry, I was not raising my hand to make a second. I have Okay, else is there a second for that motion? I would second that. <clears throat> Seconded by Representative Grahowski, debate or discussion? Okay, my concern with going into a work session now and deciding on language is, I mean, there's nothing that prevents Representative Berry from preparing language, from working on it with them and setting it up for work session. I just don't see, uh, most of the committee members aren't here, why we have to vote on that, the substance of what's gonna be drafted. We're going to need another work session anyway on this bill, and we're going to need a public hearing. So nothing really prevents us from, you know, just sitting down with Lindsay and talking with her about it and getting it ready for a work session. Kind of seems like wasted time to me. Uh, Representative uh, Senator Stewart. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we'd probably echo those same concerns at this point. Um, and we'd rather go a, a different route than today, if that'd be possible. Senator Barry, thank you. Um, I under the reason I made the motion is that I understood that uh, Senator Lawrence that you preferred that we take a vote on whether to um, have some legislation drafted. Uh, but I think the path that you just outlined is probably preferable. I, I I agree that we don't necessarily need to vote in order to schedule in or, in order to prepare something. Um, so if, uh, if, if Lindsay is in agreement that it doesn't require a vote of the committee to draft the language and to bring it to a public hearing, um, I will certainly retract my motion and um, simply commit to working with Lindsay to bring legislation to this committee pursuant to the report. Um, so right. I, I guess and I just, just want to confirm with Lindsay that, that that will work and that she doesn't need any vote of the committee to do that with me. 
That I'd have to check on. I don't think there's an issue with, you know, with having language worked on. I do think that we may have to have some discussion about the process to get to a public hearing um, because a committee bill will have to be referred back to the committee. Um, so that that's an element to consider. But in terms of moving forward with language, I don't see any problems with doing that. But if any problems come up, I will absolutely let you know immediately. Okay, I'll, I will withdraw my motion for now, just so we can move forward with the other reports and we can always circle back on this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anything else on this report? Representative Barry, you still have your hand up? Sorry, that's uh, old news. Okay. So Lindsay, uh, which of the quasi agencies go over them with us um, that we have to report? Yes, bear with me one moment. So to, we are hearing from uh, Maine Municipal and Rural Electrification Cooperative Agency and Efficiency Maine Trust. Um, from the Electrification Cooperative, we have Scott Hollowell and he is in the uh, attendee room right now. And on behalf of Efficiency Maine Trust, we have Michael Stoddard and Greg LeClaire. Um, Maine, the Electrification Cooperative, um, the information that they submitted actually for both entities is available on the committee's website. Um, and as I previously mentioned, Mr. Hollowell did ask if he could, um, yep. the committee could hear him first. Um, due to just That's the fine. Brevity Why don't we move uh, Mr. Hollowell over first? He is on his way. Okay, thank you, Jason. Great, are you there, Scott? I believe I am. Great, okay. Um, you have the floor, go ahead and present okay. your report. Okay. Well, good morning, Senator Lawrence and Representative Barry and members of the committee. Uh, as said earlier, my name is Scott Hollowell with Eastern Maine Electric Cooperative. I'm here today speaking on behalf of the Maine Municipal Rural Electrification Cooperative. Um, I filed the report. Uh, I don't have a lot. I can briefly go over that. The Maine Municipal Rural Electric Cooperative Association is a vehicle to help promote any joint action among the state's consumer-owned utilities. The offices of Derigo, which is a group of the consumer-owned utilities, also serve as officers of the uh, cooperative agency. The agency does not receive any funding from the state at all. Any costs that would be incurred by the agency would be funded by the consumer-owned utilities that are involved in any, any matters. Uh, while this agency has not been active um, as, as of late or at all, actually, we, we still believe there's value in having it exist um, as the industry keeps changing and is continual changes. By having this agency available to the consumer-owned utilities, it can just be another tool that we can use to help our consumers with the, providing the best uh, service and low cost power as possible. So that's really all I have to report. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Great. Are there questions from members of the committee? Yes. Representative Barry, I can see your hand. Thank you, Senator Lawrence. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Hollowell, for um, coming forward and, um, and, and sharing this, this agency report. Um, I wonder, could, could you remind us, I forgive my ignorance, but is this, is this uh, agency technically a cooperative similar to a G&T cooperative or is it, is it really a different animal altogether? I believe it's a different animal. I, I think it's a agency of the state, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, trying to check real quickly here. Okay. It is in the obviously in the title it does talk about a electric cooperative, but I believe it's a agency of the state subject to further verification. Got it. Thank you. And uh, I have a couple more follow up questions, if I may, Mr. Chair. Sure. Go ahead with your couple of questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Hallwell. Does it does it have? Uh, am I correct? It has the authority to issue revenue bonds, and and as a follow up to that, um, to to um, access tax exempt financing. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to sort of the combined uh, uh, credit worthiness, you know, fiscal potential, uh, what kind of a transaction, 
how big a transaction might this uh, agency be able to undertake if it were to get ambitious? I, I do believe it can issue uh, bonds. Um, I, we haven't really, since we, we do not have a project before us, we hasn't been a need to truly mm -hmm. dig deep into that and, and have a full understanding of it. But my, I'll say my, my top level understanding is that there is the ability to issue bonds. And, and I, I believe there's the issue to borrow from the federal government as well. Uh, but, but again, that's still subject to further verification just given we haven't dug into it. So as far as the, the size of a transaction, I, I really can't answer that with any certainty. Just, I, I think it would all depend upon the project and the type of security that would be available for the project. Mm -hmm. Got it. You had another question, Representative Barry? I do, thank you. I guess my last question is, um, are you able to give any um, examples, just you know, hypothetical, theoretical examples of, of um, where this could potentially be useful in the future? Yeah, uh, I, I guess potentially, um, and again, we haven't dug deep into this, so this is very high level, is yep. the consumer-owned utilities potentially could join together to build some type of generating facility that could then supply power to the different utilities, um, that, that'd be one possibility. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I guess potentially could, the way I read the, the law, potentially go out and secure a, a large power supply contract for all involved. But again, these are all subject to further verification. What about building a transmission line? I guess I, I, I'm not sure on that. I, I, I guess just thinking it through, it would seem that if you build a generating plant, you need to have some form of transmission to get it from the generator to the into the distribution system. But, but again, I, I wouldn't want to say that with certainty. Great. Any further questions, Representative Barry? No, thank you very much. And I, I know you're uh, you're busy running a utility, so appreciate your joining us today. Thank you all. Any other questions from committee members? I don't see anybody, so thank you very much. Thank you. And Lindsay is our next and last one, Michael Stoddard. Correct. Okay, why don't we beam Michael Stoddard across? Go ahead, Michael. Morning, Chairman Lawrence, Chairman Barry, members of the committee. My name is Michael Stoddard. I am the Executive Director of the Efficiency Main Trust. Nice to see you again. Um, we filed a report on the 1st of February as we are required to do annually, um, reporting on certain uh, actions as a quasi-state agency required under um, Title V, Section 12023. Uh, and that talks about sole source procurements that we used during the course of last year and uh, certain other expenses like uh, contributions. And so I'm happy to answer any questions about that. It's only a page and a half, so there's not a whole lot of information there, but would be um, happy to take any questions you might have. Great. Are there any questions for Michael? Seeing none, thank you very much. Lindsay, does that conclude what we have for today? Um, that concludes what we have for today. It also wraps up um, the committee's review of the quasi-independent entities. So I didn't know, um, you know if the committee has any concerns on this. Um, it sounds like you got your questions answered. Um, so unless you see an issue, usually what happens is the committee sends a letter um, to the GOC advising you know, that you conducted the reviews. And then if there were any issues that you wanted to highlight for them, you would. Um, otherwise, if, if things look okay, I'm happy to get a draft of that letter together. Um, do people want to get a draft of that letter together and then have a work session where we review and see if there's anything we want added to the legislate, the letter? Or are people comfortable just sending that letter off now? Any comments, questions? Then I would say, Lindsay, let's uh, get the letter off now. Nobody has any concerns. 
Excellent. I'll get going on that. Okay. Anything else to come before the committee? Anything from committee members? Great. Seeing none, thank you all for coming today. And uh, we'll see you on, is it Tuesday is our next one, Lindsay? Uh, we don't have a schedule out for next week. Um, okay. So we'll be chatting about that and the schedule will hopefully be coming out shortly. And Representative Foster, I noticed that expression. Are you concerned that you won't have anything to do next week? I'm just concerned that if I don't get that schedule, I, I won't have uh, <laughs> be well prepared over the weekend. Well, Representative Barry and I, we were unable to meet uh, earlier this week with uh, Lindsay and because of the long hearing um, yesterday. So um, I'm sorry, Tuesday. So we will uh, be meeting today and hopefully getting a schedule out pretty quickly. Well, thank you. I'll manage somehow, I'm sure. Okay, I'm sure you will. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, we'll see you all on Tuesday.